All right. Here we are. There. Okay. So um, this uh, this starts in a, a broader view of what I'm philosophy of engineering and so forth, which I've been working on, and uh, and uh, so that's the bold statement: new understanding of nature, of reality, and our uh, role in its emergence. Why not? So just real quick on my background. Uh, I'm now kind of Portland State University, but I started in philosophy of science with kind of, you know, Popper and Kuhn and Feyerabend <coughs> and so forth, and uh, realizing that the dominant philosophy of science, according to these rebels, as I call them, really didn't make any sense. Uh, I gradually, where do you go? And I gradually uh, moved over to philosophy of engineering, which is kind of a euphemism for, uh, for pragmatism, really. It's very, very, very closely uh, associated with that. Anyway, so... Uh, and this, the move to, to uh, this engineering research program really begins with a paradigm shift from, uh, from a scientific to an engineering framework. And this, I have this book out if anybody wants it, talks about that. So the paradigm shift, you all know, like I love the, uh, the little uh, chicken, so you were, in, <laughs> you were in the egg. It's only when you come out of the egg that you realize that there's a bigger world and you look back. So the idea is, a big part of this is the idea of superseding which is to say that the view that you come to needs to be able to make sense of why anybody would have thought the previous. Okay, so, so I see the engineering perspective to me is the larger tent, and science is sort of just a special case within that. So science is really kind of engineering research. Now, getting to the, to the evolution thing, this is my friend Eugene Kuhn, and he was one of the developers of CRISPR, incidentally, this new technology. And so this is at the 19, or the, the 2009, uh, uh, celebration of uh, Darwin's, you know, origin of the species, 150-year thing, and and, uh, and basically, uh, not to miss words, the modern neo-Darwinian synthesis is gone, and that's kind of where I am. So the question is, what's next? And what I'm going to suggest to you is, what's next is an engineering view of evolution. Uh, and uh, Kuhner also said, for instance, uh, uh, virtually every uh, derivable component of the Darwinian synthesis, either original or the neo-Darwinian thing, has been empirically refuted. And he also had another one who said, uh, the dirty little secret is that Darwin never actually had a theory of origin of species. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest here is a broad picture, which is if you buy into the biological evolution, it turns out that the socioeconomic evolution is also an engineering enterprise. And I'm not going to go back into it, but cosmo cosmologically it goes back to, you have to go to Timaeus and Origin of the Universe and Big Bang and all that. So I'm picking out today, it's really a sub-theme, which I call Hawking Evolution. And what I'm going to argue to you is that evolution is inclusive uh, with an expanding capability and expanding capabilities and opportunities. Uh, it's not selective and adaptive in the, Ar in the Darwinian sense. Let me say, you know, survival the fittest, adaptation, sorry. And uh, the reason I call it, this is Stephen. I've had the opportunity to set up a couple of lectures for him. And this is him meeting with a group of students with disabilities. I was in Portland. This is in Seattle. This is another one in Seattle. So Stephen wanted to do this. And it's, Stephen, is the reason I like this, he's a champion of the disabled for, you know, as part of society. <coughs> now, to get into this, this is uh, George Bucciarello. Uh, and he, he argued that engineers should be taught that modern engineering is a natural extension of biological evolution. Okay? Now, in some of this, you may be like, well, you know, we are a natural extension of biological evolution, and we're doing engineering, therefore it's a... So why would anybody ever doubt that? Uh, see, I don't want to go forward here too quick. Wait a minute. So, so let me use an example. So my, my favorite, and I don't want to pick on them, example is... Uh, uh, diabetics, type type one diabetics. Okay, so these are kind of a recurrent thing. It looks like it's genetic because it just keeps coming up all over the place. And uh, and type one diabetics used to die at 12, 14, 16 years old. And uh, but then we got insulin therapy. Okay, so now these these uh, type one diabetics are surviving, thriving. They're living well into life and having children. I have a, one of my son's friends, who's, who's type 1 from very, very early on, has just had a baby with this thing. Now, what's happening with these people, then they're, they're breeding into the, into the gene pool. 
Okay, so you might say, well, there's this weakness, there's this gene to <laughs> having type 1 diabetes, and it's now entering the gene pool, and it's going very general, and it's, it's quite, quite advanced. This has been going on for some time, and there's a lot more people actually coming up with type 1 diabetes. So you might say, well, wait a minute, so that's like, so this is the, we're going the wrong way here. So this is the, the gene pool is getting weaker as a consequence of this, this technology. Okay, so I want to just say, first of all, I'm going to say that's a, just a token of a type. Okay, so that's not really, so you got eyeglasses, so let me point out. So, so if we didn't have eyeglasses, many of us would not be doing so well compared to you know, competition to other people. So, so now we have all the people with, with have problems with their eyes, that's probably a lot of it's genetic, are now breeding into the gene pool, and so we again weaken the gene pool. Now, we take this further. I would suggest to you that most, if not all, technological advances have exactly the same effect of allowing the weaker to survive and thrive and go. So back to like agricultural technologies. How many people would be surviving without all the advances in, in agricultural technology? Not many. How would we do? How would we all do in, in, in a hunter-gatherer? Uh, situation. Uh, also, things like uh, there's a lot, there's a Kenny McEwen wrote a thing about the all the advances in health and longevity in the last 300 years, uh, pretty much due to uh, preventive uh, things like cleaning up the water and the sewers and food preservation. And these are all engineering technological advances. So the the general gist here is that uh, uh, advances in technology expand both their ability to do things and the opportunity to do things, and they promote inclusion, okay? So I used to call that, just for fun, survival of the weaker, and uh, I deem it hockey revolution just for fun. Uh, so this is, I think, is a general characteristic. And uh, this is, uh, I this, got this, he gave me this slide, so. Oop, oop. No, I've screwed it up. Okay, so this is my friend uh, Tim White. He's a paleontologist down in uh, at Berkeley, and uh, talked to him about this. And he goes like, "Oh yeah, over the last three million years, virtually all the advances in human body type and so forth have been due to uh, technologically driven niches and geographic expansion. Anyway, it's all technology: fire, stone tools, boom, boom, all the way up. So the whole of the evolution of human." humans going forward has been due to these expansive technologies that allowed the weaker to survive, re-enter, re you know, uh, uh, get into the gene pool, and somehow they mix this in. So, so, uh, so this is, uh, so Lucy is, is what, uh, one of the things that uh, Tim found 3.2 million years ago, and this is just for fun. This is a woman who's in a speaker series I run recently. It's kind of a vampy picture, so I thought it'd be kind of cool. So how do we get to, from Lucy to Kara Cooney, uh, 3.2 million years, and what I'm, gonna, I'm suggesting to you is it came through this inclusion of the weaker. Okay? So I suggest to you that Kara is smarter and more beautiful and uh, more capable, and she's all these things uh, more than Lucy and that didn't happen by any sort of selection of the fittest. You bet the more fittest, you know, Lucy, you can enter with a gorilla or something, I don't know. But it's not. So the evolution has actually been in this inclusive and expansive manner. Um, so there's my friend uh, Ian Tattersall talking about this too. So he emphasizes this whole, the same theme, and he goes in particular and talks about language as a tool that really differentiated us from, from uh, from uh, uh, many of our uh, uh, hominid ancestors. And there's this expression, I think it comes from Wallace, you know, like in Darwin and Wallace, it called more than nature needs. And the expression here, what's important is because what it's saying is, is that, you know, say all these things are evolving, you know, you know they're, they're not adaptations, okay? They're not adaptations, language isn't adapting to anything. I mean, it's, it's an expansive thing, okay? So that's the theme of this, you know, it's a, this is, uh, all of technology is going that way. There's a guy, Robert Reed's great book I recommend. It's called Biological Emergences. can't read it here. Biological Emergences, Evolution by Natural Experiment. This is a very pragmatist thing. So he actually sees uh, organisms as having uh, agency, so to speak, and running experiments. So this random mutation nonsense of Darwin uh, really has a completely different basis in an engineering view of, uh, of evolution. And... Uh, what, what Reed are, uh, emphasizes, he says, 
Uh, life isn't adapting to anything. It's not a convergence. I mean, so we're going from non-adaptation to adaptation. Where, what are we adapting to? You know, um, adaptation of the weak or something. It says life is emerging from. It's like we're coming out of dirt and whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a, a bootstrap up process. We're not, life is not immediately find itself in some strange situation. So, and he uses this term increasing adaptability. I really like that term exactly. But what he's saying is, is that that the parameter of evolution, what's, what's happening here, is uh, uh, an increasing ability to uh, adapt to different environments. Okay, so we're expanding our ability to do things. We're expanding things out. And so the whole thing is expansing and so forth. So I, I rather like the other, yeah, this is my term, or <laughs> several other people use increasing ability to perform work. And this is work in the engineering sense, not work in the physics sense. Work in the physics sense is just zero sum, brick up, brick down. Work in the engineering sense is actually doing something. So our ability was increasing our ability to do things, and it's, again, it's expansive sort of thing. Okay? Uh, so just to emphasize it, the Malthusian error <laughs> you were going to talk about. So uh, and there's a great book, uh, the best one I've heard on this, uh, Matt, uh, Matt Ridley's book called Evolution of Everything. And it, you know, I did the suggestion that there was a link between Darwin and, and Hitler. Of course, we say a little bit. He documents it ad nauseum. It's really horrible, and uh, there's just no question. Really. But he also notes that in the 1990s, India had a uh, a food crisis. Okay, so they came to the United States. We had all sorts of excess food. Came to the United States, and the State Department said, "Okay, I'll tell you what. We'll give you food if you'll sterilize people." So here was the bargain for the <laughs> starving people in India. We'll give you food if you allow us to sterilize you. That's the United States of America in the 1990s. So this didn't go away after, you know, the Holocaust. It's still around. And there are a lot of people, I believe, there are a lot of people who still think this way. And the people who, was it Enron? It was this, the guys of this horrible uh, company that was created in the United States. And they listen to these guys and they go like, oh, yeah, that's survival of the fittest and eugenics and we're better and, you know, kill other people. And, and Malthus's thing was... Uh, uh, so I think he was, was very, and uh, a lot of the eugenics guys, don't help the poor, because they're losers anyway. Why should we be helping Stephen Hawking survive? Why would we help all these people with disabilities? They're losers, you know, why? they're poor people, they're poor for a reason. Rich people are rich for a reason, right? And so rich people should get stuff and we should not help the poor. That was Malthus's position and that comes out of that. I'm telling you, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, Dawkins plays into this. so. What I call Dawkins' revelation. He's, he doesn't get the guts to really come out and say it, but he did it anyway. He starts out with this selfish gene thing. And, and it's, all, it's a, this very important part of the scientific thing is a zero sum game thing. It's a symmetry, action. It's like Newton's third law action, reaction, you know, symmetry, net change. Zip. Okay, so I always have these zero sum games. And, uh, and so for, for Dawkins, he would say things like, you know, everybody you should be selfish. That's the natural way. That's what, what uh, Malthus said. You know, limited resources. We're all populating. Therefore, you know, it's big competition. And uh, and so, in order to get ahead, so Dawkins, <laughs> in order to get ahead in the world, you have to hurt somebody else. But that's the rational thing to do because you're trying to get ahead. You know, if you actually are altruistic, you actually have to hurt yourself in order to help somebody else, and that's irrational. I'm just saying. Well, then he had this book called The Extended Phenotype, and his revised version, his more recent edition of the Selfic Gene, which I just went through again, he kind of includes this, but he just doesn't quite admit what he did. So what happened in the Extended Genotype, he goes like, you know, hey, actually, if I want to uh, advance my genes, uh, I need to have all these other, he's looking at an ecosystem, like a, a beaver's dam and all these different parts of the ecosystem, and he go like, in order for my genes to go forward, I need all these others, you know, supply me with things. You know, if it's just me by myself, what am I going to eat? And so he, real, he realizes over time that he's, that this, basically the best way to get ahead is to, you know, help others and make sure that I'm, you know, in other words, you're contributing to the ecosystem. As the ecosystem advances, you advance and so forth. So, and this is tied up with something, there's this undercurrent in theory of evolution for a long time. So everybody is Darwinian, Darwinian, Darwinian. There's another group over here called ecologists, okay, and they're, I'm going to go on with them a little bit. Um, those are my notes here. I'm just going with the slides. But another thing to say about the Malthusian thing, as far as this empirical 
reality is, uh, a friend of mine at UCLA just made a statement to me I love. He said, in the last 75 years, population has doubled and, uh, and uh, world economic input has increased eightfold. Eightfold. Population doubled, economic output doubled eightfold. Okay, so what this is saying essentially is that the, a normal, let's say a normally expanding world or whatever it is, uh, that, that output or opportunity uh, greatly outruns population. Okay, exact opposite of Malthus, okay? Now, uh, and I've been doing a lot of work with these, these guys, Mike Russell, so uh, origin of life research, uh, you know, this is all this, I don't know if you guys are into this, but one of, one of the things they found in the, that I got into a lot is the, it, 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 down here, there are these biological consortia, so these are bacteria, and so one will use uh, sulfur at uh, valence plus three and export it at minus five, and the other one picks it up at minus five and exports it back at plus three. So they have these, there are these consortia, they're going back and forth. Now this is very similar to, uh, but they also, they're net productive. So they have this stability, like homostatic, homostasis, but then they also are generating CH, CH products. So this is just, um, there's a great new book, Pukowski. Uh, and so he's looking at his consortia, and he's seeing these as quite general. This is the idea that consortia in, in, in evolution, or in ecology in particular, the ecological model of evolution, these consortia are fundamental relationships. And so he said, nice thing, he says, one rule within a microbial consortia is, is uh, no member uh, can outcompete the others, because a winning microbe would be energetically disadvantaged, because basically they're feeding each other, okay? They're feeding each other, and, and if, you, if one say, well, ah, so let's say the flora and fauna of the earth, they say, oh, let's, all, let's, let's get rid of all the plants, <laughs> let's just have animals, right? whoops, but we were feeding on plants and vice versa. So, uh, this is my buddy, uh, so this is another example of expansion. So, the transition to complex life hinged on, a, on one unique sim, uh, symbiotic uh, bioenergetic jump, uh, rather than natural selection action on mutations accumulated gradually among physical isolated prokaryotes. So you've got prokaryotes, you know, that have no um, uh, nucleus and they're kind of limited and stuff, bacterial stuff. And then there's this event happens where the first eukaryote comes and it takes in these mitochondria that all of a sudden it becomes, has, evolves into having a nucleus and it's all this energetic thing. So the, the bio, the eukaryotes are 200,000 times more energetic than the prokaryotes. Okay, so this huge energetic thing. And <laughs> this is a quote from, uh, from, uh, from Bill. It says, if evolution works like a tinkerer, evolution with mitochondria works like a core of engineers. So this sense I want to get here is this enormous enabling that occurs. Okay, all of a sudden, life is, an, is able to do all sorts of things it wasn't able to do before. This is increasing capacity to form work. Like, good book uh, by Nick Lane on this. Uh, as Bill said, he stole all my ideas, but uh, nonetheless. Uh, a large scale. So uh, I had a, one of my talks a long time ago, I called it Lovelock's Problem. And to realize, he looked at uh, Venus and Mars and stuff, and, and they just are dead. Okay? And he looks at Earth, and it's like this huge non-equilibrium system that keeps just going on. And the non-equilibrium system has been there for three billion years. We can look at the mineral records and stuff that's been going on. And so what you see in this thing is, this, again, the consortia of the H2, or just a simple version, the CO2 produ producers and the O2 producers, okay? And they're feeding each other. You know, the, the, the negative, the uh, 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 exhaust, so to speak, of one is, is the fuel for the other. And uh, this is fundamental. So, and in the, 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 what the... Uh, Earlier guys would say is that's a, uh, they're also, it's also producing something. So what Lovelock and uh, Lynn Margulis and stuff pointed out is that this, this dynamic is kind of like homostasis, okay? So my body, I have all sorts of homostatic things going on, my temperature, my salinity, all that sort of stuff going on, keeping my body, I have all these things balancing, all these little consortia going on in my body balancing anything, but those don't determine what I do. They enable, but I'm like a, I'm like a, Corps of Engineers, okay? I'm able, I'm able to act in the world. And that's how all organisms and the whole Earth and probably cosmos, same way. So this is uh, Dorian Sagan and Eric Schneider. 
which is nice to put called into the cool. I don't like that aspect of it because they see the ultimately the universe running down. I don't. Uh, and they use an engineering version. So the, the biosphere is an engine. So the sun is a source and the uh, cold space is out. And that, that engine has been evolving, has been developing, kind of like this, you know, the Newcomen engine and then the Watt engine. And so this, the engine is getting more is getting more, and more. And what's it increasing? It's getting increasing capacity to perform work in the engineering sense. So the Earth, the evolution of the biosphere has been this really understood on an engineering basis. Okay. Um, Kind of ran out of time. Just emphasize, it's in my book a lot, but the, in the scientific framework, you get this action reaction symmetry, zero sum game. That's the whole framework. They're really tied to that. This is one of the big reasons a lot of people haven't, get, haven't been able to get out of this because they can't buy into uh, energy being created. Okay? Just tell you, what's the definition of energy? Capacity to perform work. What was I just telling you the last slide? Increasing capacity to perform work. So and the problem is, is in the scientific, you don't even get a universe because everything just adds up to zero. John Barrow <laughs> called the book of nothing. So you don't even have a zero. And the engineering framework is non-symmetry. Work and uh, engineering work is symmetry breaking, uh, changing the course of events. You get a real history and a net productive, and you get an actual universe. Uh, real quick, just in, in economics, supposedly supply demand. That was a whole scientific approach to economics, but then this started. They started noting this. Why is the equilibrium point going up? You know, Schumpeter says, you know, uh, this is it's the technology stupid. Uh, that's completely unexplainable in terms of scientific economics. That should just be going. What economics does is this. It just goes to equilibrium. So they have this idea of exogenous. So like if you get hit by a hurricane or something happens, you know, you just then then it may go up and down a little bit, but it will always be. That's just a fluctuation. The economy. So anyway, so here's an example solo. Argues this, this: these productivity gains increased. Like the farmer in 19, 1850 was producing two bushels of uh, of corn per acre. By 1950, it was 200. Okay, so here's my one of my heroes, uh, Paul Romer. In 1990, he said, "Look, no, it's it's not an exogenous changes. No, what technologies are doing are not, is not just this. They're doing this. Okay, they're natural wealth creators." They're naturally producing. They're naturally expansive. Okay, so he's saying endogenous. So, so he redefines economics, and just the way I'm t saying it, I'm redefining economics. It's a little easier maybe for some to see in terms of economics. Great book, Knowledge and the Wealth of Nations, by David Warsh, tells the story of Paul Romer. So one of the things is, um, so Romer's come up with examples. One is Starbucks used to have, or still has three sizes of, drink, and, and they used to have three sizes of lids. Now they have one size lid, three size lid. What do they do? Well, they just change the geometry of the cup. So that's an innovation, okay? Supply chain, uh, easier. So then and then Paul says, well, wait, you know, it's like 10 years ago, I used to have to pay $100 to put another gigabyte of RAM in my computer. He says, now I can get another gigabyte of RAM for 10 bucks. And he says, and I didn't do anything. And the follow-up is, somebody in my ecosystem, economic ecosystem, Solved the problem, did something that benefited me. So that, whoa, it's in my interest that you guys go out and do some nice innovations. So it's in my interest that the other people in my ecosystem succeed. And this is the same point I was making about Dawkins' revelation. Oh, wait a minute, it's really good that my, <laughs> my ecosystem is doing really well because that makes, gives me greater capabilities. Um, and Romer emphasizes real quick here. Romer emphasizes it's the ideas. It's not like one cup of coffee, either you drink it or I drink it. But if it's plowing my field, that's an idea. Okay, so that's the ideas that, that are, uh, produce these uh, accelerations. And so, so it's not how much land or water or gold you have, it's what you do with it. Uh, is there a limit to growth? The most uh, soundly refuted uh, uh, prediction of uh, 1959 was that we'd all be starving to death by 1985 due to population growth. In fact, we've doubled the population and output has gone up eightfold. Uh, so again, Paul's uh, term here for indigenous uh, growth is increasing capacity for work. I, I asked him, is that the same thing that Reed's saying? He says, yeah, I asked Reed, is this the same thing <laughs> you're saying? He said, yeah. So it's uh, the same deal. Uh, big thing is the, the, the uh, economic man in the scientific version is like perfectly informed, you know, perfectly informed and, da -da -da, and you know, like it's, a, it's obviously an absurd assumption, but in when we move to this, in, uh, economic man's an, an agent, just as in Reed's 
idea of, of uh, evolution by natural experiment that organisms are, are in fact agents. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. So I'm just going to wrap up here. So uh, one of my heroes here he had a great book for, on transhumanism called More Than Human, which I recommend. And they wrote this, another great book. Just blew me because I was working all this stuff, and I remember I said, God, Ramiz, how did you ever come? Said, you can't imagine how difficult it was to come up with this book. It's a beautiful book. And the idea is, again, it's about ideas. So is there any limit to this kind of, to this expansion? And what he's saying is no. All the limits of growth guys are just wrong because it's not how much water or this or that you have. No, it's what you do with it. And so the power of ideas on a finite planet is that. Okay. Uh, this is another great book, What Technology Wants. I, I wish he'd said what engineering wants, but he says technology is a living force uh, that can expand our individual potential if we listen to what it wants. Uh, okay, so what I've tried to argue was that uh, biological evolution, social evolution are better understood as engineering enterprises, importance of hawking evolution, uh, the essential inclusion of the weaker. Uh, I'll, I'll just cut off of this. This is another, this is the, one of the great visionaries, uh, Bill McDonough. Highly recommend this book. He says, he says I'm, I'm kind of sick of sustainability. It's like getting up every morning and asking how you can be less bad. So he says, no, we should be designing for abundance. This is an expansive world. We should realize our place in the world is expansive. We don't have any limits on these things. Of course, you keep doing the same technology over and over and again. You're going to go off the cliff, but nine for abundance. Here's another one. We should design uh, to love all the children. <laughs> as I go? Love all the children of all the species for all time. You've got to struggle with that a little bit. If you get an expansive thing, it's like everybody's, everybody and everything is included in a funny way. I and mean, we're all going to die in our you know, limited thing, but it's a very expansive view, and it has uh, all sorts of morality thing in it, too. So I recommend it. Okay. Any questions? Perfectly clear. No. <laughs> um, how do you deal with the um, increasing number of deaths resulting from technology? For example, road deaths are the ninth biggest cause of deaths in the world, and 60% of those killed are of breeding age. Yeah. So isn't that uh, yeah, it's problem. Well, yeah, no, survival it's, of the fittest? So, so, no, so, <laughs> I, well, I don't think so. But, but what McGonagall says, he says, like, People dying on a road, what do we got? It's got a design problem. Fix it. And he says you got too much carbon in the atmosphere. Nothing wrong with carbon. I'm carbon, moral carbon. It's not, it's, not a, it's a design problem. Okay, and part of the upcycle thing is to see each of the things like that, all these negative things. These are problems, they're opportunities. Let's get better cars, different you know, things. I, mean, I don't think those are long term problems. And, I, and, yeah, but go I don't ahead. understand how that isn't, how, how that ties in with. Um, uh, tech, uh, evolution as, as, as including the weaker. Surely what we're doing is just changing the pressures uh, and, and, and the criteria for fitness. Yeah, no, I don't think it's the case. So, so that's, I skipped over that slide. Sorry, maybe I should go back to it. Uh, because you say, well, wait a minute, so like, Terry, what are you talking about? It's so like selection, so you're saying that, that it, it doesn't proceed by selection, but going from current state of affairs to a future better state of affairs, that's a selection. That's what engineers do. Engineers are problem solvers. They're trying to go from a current state of affairs to a future more desirable state of affairs, okay? So that's the, that's the basic thing. So that's, in a sense, it's a selection. The main point is it's not a Darwinian selection. It's not like, you know, it's an expansive selection. We're going to better and better is always expansive and inclusive. Go ahead. How does this, um, I mean, how do you define better? Mm. Ah. <laughs> and, and how does that fit in with, especially, I mean, you referenced economics uh, before with kind of this uh, the somewhat Darwinian neoliberal capitalistic society that we're in with, you know, in, in, in increasing wealth inequality, yeah. uh, you know, with, I mean, where is the pressure for the change to that dynamic? Uh. I think it's here. Um, I mean, it, it, this idea of it's in my interest that it does succeed. My, one of my reactions when I first came across this in this context was like, damn, that sounds a lot like the golden rule. And, and I think if you do play this out, it does say, wait a minute, wait a minute, is this, you know, inequality, is that a good thing? You go like, 
Maybe not. And if you actually look around, uh, Steve Johnson has a good idea, look out where do good ideas come from and see all these people coming from, you know, the managed to get their way up and stuff. So good ideas come from anywhere. And they can come from, you know, so the, the ba I think the basic run through this thing is instead of having a, you know, a, a skewed, you know, economic distribution like that, it should probably be a normal curve. Okay? So most of the wealth should be in the middle class. There are always going to be some poor people. We're going to have a few rich people. That's good. But basically, we should have something like a normal curve distribution. That's probably the optimum. Another way to say it is I say, the most moral system turns out to be the best economic system. Okay, the system that will work best to produce the great new ideas and everybody you know, uh, working together turns out to be the one that is sharing. And it's not just it's not saying it's not a socialistic, you know, extreme Marxist, you know, like everybody gets you know, an equal bit of stuff. No, it's not a particularly good use of resources necessarily, but you don't really know. I mean, part of it, you don't know where the new ideas are going to come from. They just, they're not predictable. I mean, who came up with the Starbucks cup, cup thing? I mean, if you start looking I mean, at they're, innovations. They're, they're, they're not perfectly predictable, but they're reasonably predictable. No, um, not even close. Where did the internet come from? Where did computers come self. from? What? Not the global south. No, but I mean, yeah, but I mean, there's guys like uh, Nathan Merville, I remember this friend of mine at Microsoft was the head of, you know, like, where is it, you know, we have this internet thing, is, you know, li they're going to look at the libraries and stuff. It's completely, completely missed, completely missed. Uh, them going, everybody going mobile, Intel, where I live, and it was like, oops. And, and if you go back through the different, you know, go back 100 years or 200 years and look at people who predicted, you know, like, here's what's going to be in 1985 or 1995, it's almost always wrong. And I think people now are saying we're, you know, they're worried about, I, it really bothers me this idea that we're all going to be, uh, you know, technologically uh, unemployable. Yeah. If they have no history at all. <laughs> it's like, we had, in the 1850s, they, or, we had, you know, half the people in the United States were on the farm. And there's a venture capitalist friend of mine who's just like, oh, what are, where are all these people now that are going to be displaced by the technology? So there's no existing industry for, to absorb them. It was David Chen. I said, David, where was the existing industry to absorb all these people coming off the farm? It wasn't there. And there's a lot of, oh, technology. And then World War II came and go, oh, <laughs> I think we found something for these people to do. And then it just took off. And, and for all the bad stuff about Hitler, the way in which he mobilized Germany is just a choice. Well, better example, China. What's gone on in China since, what is it, 1970, 75? I mean, they brought three or 400, 500 million people from abject poverty to reasonable middle class living. You know, so I think, but you know, how they do, you gotta have the, lead, the leadership and all that sort of stuff. I mean, there's no one way forward. But I think that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a great book, uh, a guy in West Churchman Systems Theory, people start talking about this. But it was, it's, uh, the book's called The Design, uh, Design of an Inquiring System. The question is, how would you design a system that naturally inquires? Uh, Roma goes into this you know, particularly in saying essentially that the um, innovations are so useful and so powerful for society. Bill Gates, 30, 40 million dollar, billion dollars, who cares? The benefit to the society in general is vastly greater than that. So the benefit of, you know, it's almost impossible, and there's a problem for companies that want to innovate. They cannot never recover for themselves the benefit that they provide to society for these innovations. Innovations just like whew, huge benefit as it passed around. Like think of computers moving around. People are just I can do it cheaper and they can like cheaper to you and so forth. The, the, it, there's a whole movement here. People what call it accelerate. You guys know uh, Kurzweiler, uh, accelerating technologies and so forth. They're all looking for the next accelerating technology. And technology, these big technological advances do accelerate. They tend to metamorphize the whole system. My whole point in this talk is simply that, that look at Stephen Hawking. I mean, Stephen's still, he's like 70, he's 72, 74 years old now, something like that. I mean, he's been on a respirator, full time on a respirator for three years. I mean, no one makes it three years on a respirator. So why? Because he has absolutely top, top, top medical stuff. Could you provide that to everybody right now? No. But, see, but it's doable, and over a period of time, I think more and more people will be able to. But, I mean, he's got good buddies at Intel, good buddies at, at Microsoft, who just, you know, 
And by helping Stephen, doing stuff for Stephen, all the other people, I mean, the blind technologies, the, you know, all the excess technologies that all these uh, companies have provided, um, they weren't for Stephen, but they had big effort to help people who were weaker in the system to survive and thrive and inter interbreed and go on. And they're doing it. And that's, that's the way evolution happens. So with my daughter knew, uh, I get out of here, my daughter knows uh, uh, McDonough and I, an upcycle thing. And I said, does he see that that's how evolution works too? You know, so she was at a deal and I said, ask him. And, he, and, and, and she did and he said, he said, I hadn't thought about that, but yes, that's probably right. So he's thinking, McDonough's <coughs> thinking going forward. But if you take that same metaphor of, of how that works and, and play it back, the whole of evolution is operated that way. And I would, in another talk, I'd argue that the same thing is true of uh, uh, cosmology, too. The Big Bang is just a joke. <laughs> it's an embarrassment. But anyway, so.